Today, we're going to review the first two verses of the Chatur Shloki. Chatur means four, Shloka means verses or texts. So Chatur Shloki is four um, essential verses. And before we get into them, I want, I, I, as, I, as I create the course materials and move to head a little bit, I want to read a little bit about the, these particular verses from a purport uh, that's upcoming at the end of the verses. But this is also a nice introduction. So let me put them up and read from that. Okay, this is the purport from Srimad Bhagavatam 2937, part of it. As in the Bhagavad Gita, 10th chapter, the personality of Godhead Lord Krishna has summarized the whole text in four verses, namely, aham sarvasya prabhava, etc. So, the complete Srimad Bhagavatam has also been summarized in four verses, as aham evasam evagre, etc. Thus, the secret purpose of the most important Bhagavatite conclusion has been explained by the, by the original speaker of the Srimad Bhagavatam, who was also the original speaker of the Bhagavad Gita, the personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. There are many grammarians and non-devotee material wranglers who have tried to present false interpretations of these four verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam. But the Lord himself advised Brahmaji not to deviate from the fixed conclusion the Lord had taught him. The Lord was the teacher of the nucleus of Srimad Bhagavatam in four verses, and Brahma was the receiver of the knowledge. So this gives us a, a, a clue as to what's included in these four verses, just like a seed has the entire plant, all the flowers and fruits, all their seeds, and further on down the line within that one seed packed up in that compact container. Similarly, the entire Srimad Bhagavatam is compacted by the Lord's potencies into these four verses. So um, I was thinking of a nice example in the Harinam Chintamani by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. It's a conversation about chanting Hare Krishna between Lord Chaitanya and Haridas Thakur. And in that book, Haridas gives the example that chanting is similar to the rising of the sun. In the middle of the night, when there's complete darkness on a dark moon night, you can't see anything. It's completely dark if you're in that particular kind of an area. But as the sun begins to rise, Ever so gradually, you start to see shapes and forms of nature. And as the sun continues rising, everything becomes more and more clear and more and more pronounced until finally, when the sun actually rises, everything becomes very clear. So I've had this experience myself. That's why I wanted to share it. I first read these verses almost 50 years ago in the 1970s and have regularly followed them and studied them and looked at them. And then more recently, when I started giving classes on them, more in-depthly studying them. And I have that experience of understanding them more and more clearly. Shastra, scriptures, the Vedas, are actually living, dynamic, spiritual texts. They're not just dry, mundane knowledge that you read it once or twice and learn it and think that you have everything complete. It's not like that. So I want to encourage everyone to try to meditate. Take time with these verses. See what Krishna is actually saying to the first created being in the universe for the entire life of the universe. This information is pertinent. This is the information he wants descended to everyone in the universe. So let us uh, proceed. I'll put on my texts again. And we're studying May 2021, Lessons 7 and 8, Srimad Bhagavatam, Second Canto, Chapter 9, Texts 31 through 34. Samapri, you want to have somebody else read? 
and just include me later on in the readings. Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome. Okay, we'll, we'll begin uh, reading with Manvantara. If you can read, since, since this is um, very long purports and only a few verses, we will all be reading different parts of, of the same purports. So, uh, and we'll understand that by pages. So the first uh, uh, verse and part of the purport, Manvantara, please read. And then Karana, you can read the next one. The personality of God had said, knowledge about me has described in the scriptures is very confidential and it has to be realized in conjunction with devotional service. The necessary paraphernalia, <clears throat> the necessary paraphernalia for that process is being explained by me. You may take it up carefully. Lord Brahma is the topmost devotee of the Lord within the universe, and therefore the personality of Godhead replied to his four principal inquiries in four important statements, which are known as the original Bhagavatam in four verses. These, are, these were Brahma's question. One, what are the forms of the Lord in matter and in transcendence? Two, how are the different energies of the Lord working? Three, how does the Lord play with his different energies? Four, how, many, how may Brahma be instructed to discharge the duty entrusted to him? The prelude to the answers is this verse under discussion, within wherein the Lord informs Brahma that knowledge of him, the supreme absolute truth, as it is stated in the revealed scriptures, is very subtle and cannot be understood unless one is self-realized by the grace of the Lord. The Lord says that Brahma may take the answers as he explains them. This means that transcendental knowledge of the absolute supreme being can be known if it is made known by the Lord himself. Thank you. Um, now, Karna, but I, I want everybody to meditate on that last part of the purport made known by the Lord himself. This knowledge can only be understood when Krishna makes it known to us personally. We're not in charge. Go on, Karna. With the next part of the purport, yes. Are you there, Karna? Oh, she, maybe she's not there. Okay, we'll come back. Vaishnavi, could you read the next one? Uh, yes. Purport continued. Knowledge of the personality of Godhead may be attained by devotional service only. Rahasyam means devotional service. Lord Krishna instructed Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita because he found Arjuna to be a devotee and friend. Without such qualifications, one cannot enter into the mystery of Bhagavad Gita. Therefore, one cannot understand the personality of Godhead unless one becomes a devotee and discharges devotional service. This mystery is love of Godhead. Therein lies the main qualification for the knowing, of, knowing the mystery of personality of Godhead. And to attain the stage of transcendental love of Godhead, regulative principles of devotional service must be followed. The regulative principles are called Vidhi Bhakti or devotional service of the Lord and they can be practiced by a neophyte with his present senses. Such regulative principles are mainly based on hearing and chanting of the glories of the Lord. And such hearing and chanting of the glories of the Lord can be made possible in the association of devotees only. Lord Chaitanya therefore recommended five main principles for attaining perfection in the devotional service of the Lord. The first is association with the devotees, hearing. Second is chanting the glories of the Lord. Third, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from the pure devotee. Fourth, residing in a holy place connected with the Lord. 
fifth worshiping the deity of the lord with devotion such rules and regulations are parts of devotional service so so as requested by lord brahma the personality of godhead will explain all about the four questions put forward by brahma and others also um, and others also which are parts and parcels of the same questions i wanted to make a nice connection here as you were reading kind of saw that the supreme lord is telling here in the verse itself knowledge about me as described in the scriptures is very confidential and has to be realized in conjunction with devotional service the necessary paraphernalia for that process is being explained by me and you may take it up carefully then we read here that there were five different things that are required now just like lord brahma at the beginning of creation had to perform tapasya we all read how he sat in the whole of the universe all by himself and heard the words tapa so one has to take that same instruction individually and ask what is the tapa that i can do so that i can attain perfection and the lord is saying here is the answer i'm explaining it just do this and there are five different things to begin with it's it's so succinct and uh easy to understand yet so complex because people are covered over thank you so this is actually the mystery the the solution to the mystery um of understanding bhagavad gita and the goal of human life to engage in devotional service it's only through love it's only through love of god that all of these questions that 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 arise in the universe in our own hearts can be answered thank you so um nanda would you read next and then after nanda if karna is there okay <clears throat> 932 all of me namely my actual eternal form and my transcendental existence color qualities and activities let all be awakened within you by factual realization out of my causeless mercy wow hari bol purport the secret of success is in understanding the intricacies of knowledge of the absolute truth the personality of god it is the causeless mercy of the lord even in the material world the father of many sons discloses <clears throat> the secret of his position to the pet sons the father discloses the confidence the father discloses the confidence unto the son whom he thinks worthy an important man in the social order can be known by his mercy only similarly one must be very dear to the lord in order to know the lord the lord is unlimited no one can know him completely but one's advancement in the transcendental loving service of the lord can make one eligible to know the lord here we can see that the lord is sufficiently pleased with brahma ji and therefore he offers his cause <clears throat> causeless mercy to him so that brahma ji may have the factual realization of the lord by his mercy only thank you what can can nanda say something about the secret of success in understanding the intricacies of knowledge oh, Paul, turn it off turn the um yeah <laughs> um the secret of success uh, as as we mentioned in the previous verse was that you have to love krishna and if you don't have love for krishna and engage in devotional service then he'll never be understood So that's why we can see that there's such a dichotomy in the world that the devotees who read these books of Srila Prabhupada and engage in devotional service and in kirtan etc they have so much love and faith for it faith in it and yet there are a whole class of people who you know without any love they might read it or without any love they don't even care to read it and continue on in the darkness Thank you Nanda one more question real quick what about this mercy the causeless mercy of the lord yeah as that fit in the causeless mercy of the lord fits in in the fact that we have to do our part we have to do our part by endeavoring 
And as Dhruva Maharaj Prabhu said, you know, it's very simple. And at the same time, it's very intricate and involved. So the simple thing is, is we have to, we, you know, you get to a certain point, you take your vows, you've made your commitment, then you're, and then I really like, I really like that point that you made Prabhu, when you said, uh, what, what tapa can we do to understand the Lord? And we're just so insignificant, but our tapa can be our daily attempt. Very nice. Yeah. And one other thing that Vaisheshika Prabhu says that I also appreciate, it's like a wedge. We have to wedge in our life, in our daily life, as much spiritual sound vibration as we can. So it might start off a little bit and then you do a little bit more, then you do a little bit more. And then it's like you're totally absorbed constantly. When Wonderful. Open. When open. So that is the, that is the cause of this mercy. When we're engaged in devotional service, that's, that's actually the mercy of the Lord. When we're, when we're allowed, we've, we've made our endeavor. So Krishna is bestowing that mercy that we can develop love and faith. Yeah. Thank you. Karna? Oh, Tisha, did you have a question or are you good? Okay. Okay, um, Karna, you want to read next? I'm babysitting. Oh, you're babysitting, so you're not going to read. Are you going to read? No. Okay. So, Faye, can you read, please? One can know the supreme truth if one has unflinching faith in the bona fide spiritual master, as well as in the Lord. Such a faithful person, even though illiterate in the mundane sense, can know the Lord automatically by the mercy of the Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita also, it is said that the Lord reserves the right of not being exposed to everyone, and he keeps himself concealed from the faithless by his yoga maya potency. Negation of the mundane conception does not establish transcendental fact. In the Brahma Samhita, it is said that the Lord has a transcendental form and that he can utilize any one of his senses for any purpose. For example, he can eat with his eyes and he can see with his leg. In the mundane conception of form, one cannot eat with one's eyes or see with his leg. That is the difference between the mundane body and the spiritual body of Sakchit Ananda. A spiritual body is not formless. It is a different type of body of which we cannot conceive with our present mundane senses. Formless, therefore, means devoid of the mundane form or possessing a spiritual body of which the non-devotee can have no conception by the speculative method. The Lord has unlimited numbers of transcendental qualities and one of them is his affection for his unalloyed devotee. In the history of the mundane world, we can appreciate his transcendental qualities. The Lord incarnates himself for the protection of his devotees and for the annihilation of the faithless. His activities are in relationship with his devotees. Srimad Bhagavatam is full of such activities of the Lord in relationship with his devotees and the non-devotees have no knowledge of such pastimes. The Lord lifted Gordavan Hill when he was only seven years old and protected his pure devotees at Vrindavan from the wrath of Indra, who was over flooding the place with rain. Now this lifting of Gordavan Hill by a seven-year-old boy may be unbelievable for the faithless but for the devotees, it is absolutely believable. The devotee believes in the almighty potency of the Lord, while the faithless say that the Lord is almighty, but do not believe it.
You're muted, Sama. I'm sorry. Continue, Faye. There's one more paragraph to this. Actually, um, actually, I, I oh. wanted to ask her to speak on something here. Oh, good. Um, this section here, Faye, where it's talking about how with our senses, we can't understand the Lord. If we can't understand the Lord with our, this is how, this is how we gain knowledge in the world, just like babies. We can see that they do a lot of learning with their mouth and with their eyes. They're always, and in this way, they're gradually attaining knowledge. But what it's stating here is that the Lord doesn't have a mundane body that's perceivable by the senses. So what is it that will help us or reveal to us his body? How is that going to happen if it's not through our senses? You have to think outside the box. Uh, we have to realize that the Lord is going to reveal to us what he wants to reveal to us and respectfully attempt to ask for his mercy and that we can see and understand what it is that we're capable of. We don't have uh, transcendental senses in our condition state at least i don't not yet working on it haven't got there yet but i'm accepting with faith that the lord's um, body is not within my ability to understand with my mundane senses as imperfect as they are but i can grasp from shastra from Guru, from Srila Prabhupada's translations, that the Lord definitely has a form. It is a transcendental form. And that is the form that, as a devotee, I am falling in love with. That transcendental form, I may not be able to rationally explain it yet, but I can certainly attempt to follow in the footsteps of the devotees ahead of me that are seeing with more and more transcendental abilities than I have at this state in my development. Wonderful, thank you. There's a nice verse everybody might consider in this relationship also, in this concept. Atasi Krishna namadi nabaved grayam indrai sevan muke hi jiva do swayam eva sparatyada Atoxi Krishna Namadi Naba Ved Grayam Indrai. Indrai are the senses. Naba Ved means not understandable. Atasi Krishna Namadi. Krishna's name, his form, his pastimes are not understandable by the Indriyas, by the senses. Sevon Mukhe, he jiva do, swayam eva sparatida. But one who surrenders, who uses his tongue, Sevon Mukhe, he jiva do. Jiva means the tongue, seva. One who, one who uses his tongue and seva of the Lord, glorifying the Lord, praying to the Lord, telling others about the Lord, speaking to the Lord, uh, then these things are revealed to that person. That's a beautiful verse. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Faye, for that beautiful yes. um, uh, understanding of, of Krishna's mercy and transcendence. I'd like to have Rao read this and the next uh, verse, if if he could. Rao, are you with us? I guess uh, you're muted, Pati. You have to unmute if you want to speak. You have to unmute, Rao, if you're there. Uh, All right. Go to the next one. Okay. Uh, let's go on with uh, Tisha. Could you read this on the next verse, please? Yes. Her purport continued. The impersonal interpretation of the mundane wranglers is completely refuted in this verse because it is clearly stated here that the Supreme Lord has his qualities, forms, pastimes, and everything that a person has. All these descriptions of the transcendental nature of the personality of Godhead are factual realizations by the devotee of the Lord and by the causeless mercy of the Lord they are revealed to his pure devotee and to no one else 
Okay, 2933. Brahma, it is I, the personality of Godhead, who was existing before the creation when there was nothing but myself, nor was there the material nature, the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead, and after annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. Purport. We should note very carefully that the personality of Godhead is addressing Lord Brahma and specifying with great emphasis himself, pointing out that it is he, the personality of Godhead, who existed before the creation. It is he only who maintains the creation, and it is he only who remains after the annihilation of the creation. Brahma is also a creation of the Supreme Lord. The impersonalist puts forth the theory of oneness in the sense that Brahma, also being the same principle of I, because he is an emanation from the I, the absolute truth, is identical with the Lord, the principle of I, and that there is thus nothing more than the principle of I as explained in this verse. Thank you. Before we go on with uh, with Ian reading the next section, um, these four verses, as was explained before, are the nutshell, the essence of the Bhagavatam. We were discussing earlier that these verses have enormous purports. So uh, because they are so, and look what Lord Brahma did with them. He expanded the whole Bhagavatam. So we, we, as I want to repeat what my husband said about paying very close attention to the deep meaning of these verses. So uh, Ian, are you there? Can you read? Hello, boy, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Nice to hear you. Why yeah. don't you read this? So it's from Poor Port Continued? Mm -hmm. Okay. So accepting the argument of the impersonalist, it is to be admitted that the Lord is the creator, I, and that Brahma is greater I. Therefore, there's a difference between the two I's, namely the predominator and I and the predominated I. Therefore, there are, are still two I's even accepting the argument of the impersonalist. But we must note carefully that those two I's are accepted in Vedic literature. The, in the sense of quality, the Kato Upanishad says, Nityo Nityanam, Chaitanas, Chaitanana, Chaitanana, Eko Bahunam Yao, Vidati Kamam. The Creator I and the Created I are both accepted in the Vedas as qualitative one because both of them are Nityas and Chaitanas. Chaitanas. But the singular I is the Creator I and the Created I's are of pure number because there are many eyes like Brahma and those generated by Brahma. It is the simple truth. The father creates or begets a son. The son also creates many other sons and all of them may be one as human beings, but at the same time from the father, the son and the grandsons, all are different. The son cannot take the place of the father nor can the grandsons. Simultaneously, the father, the son, and the grandson are one and different also. The human being, as human beings, they are one, but as relatives, they are different. Therefore, the relatives, you know, relativities of the creator and the created, or the predominator and the predominated, have been differentiated in the Vedas by saying that the predominator I is the feeder of the predominated eyes. And thus, there is a vast difference between the two principles of I. Thank you, Ian. Hati, could you explain some of these things about the eyes? Certainly. Um, let's go to this explanation. This verse from the Kata Upanishad. Nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitananam. And Srila Prabhupada explains here that the creator I and the created eyes 
are both accepted in the Vedas as qualitatively one because both of them are nityas. Nitya or nityanam means, means eternal. They're all eternal. Nityo is one, nityanam is plural. And chaitanas, chaitana, chaitana means conscious. They're also conscious. Chaitana, he's one conscious, and chaitananam is the plural conscious. So there's one conscious entity that's among all the plural conscious, uh, uh, plural uh, eternals. I'm sorry, there's one eternal amongst all the eternals, and there's one conscious being amongst all the other conscious beings. Eko means one. Bahu means many. So there's one amongst all these many that is separate uniquely. Yovedadati kaman. So he's pointing out, this is the first foundation of these four verses. Ahameva sameva agri means I existed prior to the creation. In other words, we should always at heart understand this difference and not, and not become too um, absorbed in the quality nature of our being one with the Lord. Although we're spiritual, sometimes we fall back onto that concept as something to um, cultivate. But the main point that's being pointed out here is that they're different. There's a difference between the Lord and every single thing that comes from him. Nityo nityanam, chaitanas chaitananam, eko bahunam yovedadati kaman. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada has stressed so much in, in these purports, particularly, and in all of his purports thus far, and we will see in the future, the denial of impersonalism. He really combats this very strongly. And this reference to the I is foundational of that. So uh, keep that in mind also. Akadasi is with us now. And could you read the next slide, please, Akadasi? Uh, purport continued. In another feature of this verse, no one can deny the personalities of both the Lord and Brahma. Therefore, in the ultimate issue, both the predominator and predominated are persons. This conclusion refutes the conclusion of the impersonalist that in the ultimate issue, everything is impersonal. This impersonal feature stressed by the less intelligent impersonalist school is refuted by pointing out that the predominator I is the absolute truth and that he is a person. The predominated I, Brahma, is also a person, but he is not the absolute. Brahma is factually seeing face to face his predominator Lord, who exists in his transcendental eternal form, even after the annihilation of the material creation. The form of the Lord, as seen by Brahma, existed before the creation of Brahma, and the material manifestation with all the ingredients and agents of material creation are also energetic expansions of the Lord. And after the exhibition of the Lord's energy comes to a close, what remains is the same personality of Godhead. Therefore, the form of the Lord exists in all circumstances of creation, maintenance, and annihilation. Thank you, Akadasi. Could you say something real quick about the uh, Krishna being a person? He's, they, I, I was meditating on this, and somehow or another, you know, when someone's a person and a dear friend, you tell them your problems, they understand you fully, and you feel confident. So even though Krishna is the grandest, he is a person. And what we're going through is very, uh, he understands. Mm -hmm. He actually understands all our plight. Can you, can you say something about that? What do you think about that, Krishna being a person? Yeah, just that that's, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's just very nice to know that. Um, yeah, and to understand that, that yeah, he does understand everything that we go through um, and that every, and also understanding that everything that we do, all the emotions that we feel, everything is coming from him and that we are the way that we are. I mean, of course, there's our conditioning, but we are the way that we are because of him. 
rather than, uh, you know, in spite of him. Um, Isn't that wonderful that we are the way we are because he has created us this way. Mm -hmm. And if we try to be like someone else, it's really hard. Mm. It's really hard. We're better at being ourselves in this even of what's that verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Who knows that verse? To perform another person's work is even if you don't do it perfectly, it's 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 not going to satisfy you. So thank you. That was that was wonderful. How about Narayan? Can you read next? Narayan? Uh yes. Can you thank hear me? You. Yes, I can very well. Okay. Purport continued. The other features of the statement is that the Supreme Truth is Bhagwan, or the Personality of Godhead. The Personality of Godhead and His Kingdom have already been explained. The Kingdom of Godhead is not void as conceived by the impersonalists. The Vaikuntha planets are full of transcendent, transcendental variegatedness including the four-handed residents of those planets with great opulence of wealth and prosperity. And there are even airplanes and other amenities, am amenities required for high-grade personalities. Therefore, the personality of Godhead exists before the creation, and he exists with all transcendental variegatedness in the Vaikuntha Lokas. The Vaikuntha Lokas also accepted in the Bhagavad Gita as being of the Sanatana nature are not annihilated even after the annihilation of the manifested cosmos. Those transcendental planets are of a different nature altogether, and that nature is not subjected to the rules and regulation of material creation, maintenance, or annihilation. The existence of the personality of Godhead implies the existence of the Vaikuntha Lokas as the existence of a king implies the existence of a kingdom. Even the devotees of the personality of Godhead are not annihilated during the period of the entire annihilation of the material world, not to speak of the Lord himself. The Lord is ever existent in all three stages of material change. Thank you, Narayan. I have one very simple question for you. Do you, do you have a car, Narayan? Oh, yes, I do. Do you like to drive your car? Yes, I do. Okay, it, it's probably a nice car, huh? Um, okay, it's an okay car. Okay, but you'd really like the real, the better car, wouldn't you? Um, yes, there's some real nice ones out there, sure. Okay, okay. Well, this, this whole explanation that Prabhupada is giving about life in the transcendental spiritual world, they actually have cars there, or, or vehicles, vehicles, even the Brahma Samhita. It, it said everyone has their, their, their own different vehicle to go from, from place to place. So it's not that things that, the, this is a perverted reflection where everything is temporary and everything is uh, pretty miserable. That your car, your car could run out of gas. You could get into an accident. That doesn't happen in the spiritual world. And this is just a little example of how life in the transcendental abode is extremely personal. And every time, everything here in the material world that we try to have a good time with and always unfortunately fail, it's happening in perfection in the spiritual world. Not that should, that should be an impetus for us to go there. The impetus is to be reestablished in our loving relationship with Krishna. These are the fringe benefits. So what do you think? You think you should dedicate your life to chanting Hare Krishna and Narayan so that you could drive the real car in the spiritual world? <laughs> and serve the real uh, boss with the best um, payment plan? Well, well, we are all on the path, I would say, you know, yeah. to a different extent. Um, I'm still working. Some people are in a different stage, one of the four different stages, but eventually I'll be totally dedicated to that purpose. And uh, I'm just preparing myself 
with your help and the help of artists in this group to be as good as I can to qualify myself, essentially. Thank you. Well, that's encouraging. Thank you so much for that. Okay, does, Pati, did you have something to say? Yes, I wanted to um, bring something to everyone's attention that uh, the first point was a hum eva eva gray, and in the purport, Srila Prabhupada was pointing out the difference between the two eyes, the predominator eye and all the other eyes, the predominated eyes. So that was the first point. Now he's taking it to the next level. Notice how he's building on the information about the person. He's saying this person isn't only separate, but he, he owns or he lives in an abode that is eternal with his own associates. He's opening the, as we, we, we gave that example of the seed, as the seed starts to germinate and starts to manifest its nature, then we see more features of what was in the seed. So I just wanted to point out, everyone can, can watch this unfold as Srila Prabhupada reveals it in his purports. First was the, the difference. Now he's, re, now he's stressing the abode and what goes on there. What is that person like? Where does he live? What are his associates like, like this in the personality? Thank you. Um, Tisha, did you have a question? Tisha? I just have, a, I have one question. Maybe you can speak to it or maybe for another time. And Prabhupada says, you know, um, I mean, yeah, in, in, in the purport, I think I, re I heard that he says, um, we're not annihilated either. Like at annihilation, not even we are annihilated. And that, am I correct? Did I really hear that? I just guess for me, that's a little confusing. Um, if maybe you could just like, what is it of what in me is not annihilated? You know what I mean? Yes, of course. What in you is not annihilated at the time of annihilation? Let's just deal with that one. Who can give the answer? I know a lot of you know the answer. It's a real quick answer. Come Akadasi, on. Akadasi Vrat is raising her hand. Akadasi Ji. The soul. <laughs> Good. That's the answer. That's the. That's what's not annihilated. Pati, did you have, was that your simple, quick, perfect answer, Akadasi Ji? Okay. <laughs> okay, Pati, why don't you explain further this? Well, what he's doing is he's pointing out that the Lord and his associates uh, in this particular part of the purport are eternal. Remember, we, we nityo nityanam, that there's one eternal amongst all the eternals. So those that are, the, 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 we've learned previously in the second canto, that at the time of annihilation, the conditioned souls who will remain in the material world enter into the body of Mahavishnu in an unmanifest state, an, un, an inactive state. And then again, at the time of creation, they're again expanded and come out and Brahmaji creates the bodies and they enter into those bodies according to their past activities. So no one is actually annihilated, but what's being emphasized here is that in Vaikuntha, in the, in the eternal kingdom of the Lord, the, the devotees aren't, no one's annihilated. The, the whole material cosmic manifestation is annihilated, but that part, the power of Yoma, remains as it is. That's what's being stressed in this particular part of the purport. Also, I'd like to add one more thing, that um, we are now uh, working on transcendence. We're working on transcendence. So uh, we are engaged in devotional service. By, by, by hearing and chanting. And we're going toward that platform of not being annihilated, right? We're, we're, we, we too will not be annihilated because we're totally becoming totally absorbed in Krishna and not identifying with that thing that will be annihilated. The whole material world, all of our friends and relatives, and it, it, it happens gradually. We see it on a smaller scale. We see our everyone dying, our parents, our friends, our, everyone is dying. So that will not happen to the soul who is becoming self-realized. He will be transferred to the spiritual world out of the world of birth and death. 
it, it, what do you, Nanda, do you have Sam, something to, yeah, we have to go on. Just to let you know, there's seven more slides now. And, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, Mandantar, why don't you, why don't you read the next one? Patsy, you have to put it up. The activities of Brahma and other demigods during the maintenance of the creation are to be understood as the activities of the Lord. The king or the head executive of a state may not be seen in the government offices, for he may be engaged in royal comforts. Yet he should be understood. Yet it should be understood that everything is being done under his direction and everything is at his command. The personality of Godhead is never formless. In the material world, he may not be visible to, in his personal form to the less intelligent class of men, and therefore he may sometimes be called formless, but actually he is always in his eternal form in his Vaikuntha planets, as well as other planets of the universes as, in, as different incarnations. The example of the sun is very appropriate in this connection. The sun in the night may not be visible to the eyes of men in the darkness, but the sun is, very, the sun is visible whenever it has risen. That the sun is not visible to the eyes of the inhabitants of a particular part of the earth does not mean that the sun has no form. One has to spiritualize the senses before one can expect to see or perceive the person, the Supreme Lord, but he is always engaged in his personal capacities, capacity, and he is eternally visible to the inhabitants of Vaikuntha face to face. Therefore, he is materially impersonal, just as the executive head of the state may be impersonal in the government offices, although he is not impersonal in the governmental, in the government house. Similarly, the Lord is not impersonal in his abode, which is always nirasta kukayam, as stated in the very beginning of the Bhagavatam. Therefore, both the impersonal and personal features of the Lord are acceptable as mentioned in the revealed scriptures. Thank you, Manvantar. Vaishnavi, would you like to read the next one? Okay, one more point. Um, one more. I, I, I specifically broke the purport up. Just want to point out again that the different progressions that are going on here. First, that I, I am different than the predominated eyes. Then that nityo nityanam, chetanas chetananam. Then the eternal nature of the Lord in his abode. And now what he's describing. So, so in other words, he exists. He's in his abode. And what's being pointed out in this part of the purport is that not only is he in his abode, but he's also active in the material world where we can't see him, just as a king might not be visible, or as the sun might not be, be visible, but they're active. So follow the progression. It's a wonderful uh, part of the verses. Okay, before, before we go on with Vaishnavi, um, Mandantara, did you have something to add to that? No, no, I was just appreciating, but I, 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 I speak poorly spontaneously, so <laughs> but okay. no, I was really appreciating the, the personal description. Do you have yeah, it, it is. I, I just want to emphasize one more thing about when we talked about Krishna as being uh, very personal and, a, and he's a friend. He's standing right there and you can talk to him the way you speak to a loving friend about your difficulties and that friend understands Krishna understands, He's, it's incredible that he actually understands what it's all about. And he's not only understands, he's orchestrating it. Okay, so Vaishnavi and then Nanda. Report continued. One should therefore have his ultimate aim of realization, not in the impersonal feature, but in the personal feature of the absolute truth. The example of sky within the pot and, and the sky outside the pot may be helpful to the student for his realization of all the of the all pervading quality of the cosmic consciousness of the absolute truth. But that does not mean 
that the individual part and parcel of the Lord becomes the supreme by false by a false claim. It means only that the conditioned soul is a victim of the illusory energy in her last snare. To claim to be one with the cosmic consciousness of the Lord is the last trap set by the illusory energy or Daivi Maya. Even in the impersonal existence of the Lord, as it is in the material creation, one should aspire for personal realization of Lord. And that is the meaning of Paschad Aham Yad Etacha Yo Vasishyetaso Asmi Aham. Brahmaji also accepted the same truth when he was instructing Narada. There is no other cause of all the causes other than than the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari. Therefore, this verse, Aham Eva, never indicates anything other than the Supreme Lord. And one should therefore follow the path of Brahma Sampradaya or the path from Brahmaji to Nanda to Vyasdeva, etc. and make it a point in life to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, or Lord Krishna. This very confidential instruction to the pure devotees of the Lord was given to Arjuna and to Brahma in the beginning of creation. The demigods like Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, Indra, Chandra, and Varuna are undoubtedly different forms of the Lord for the execution of different functions. The different elemental ingredients of material creation as well as the multifarious energies also may be of the same personality of Godhead, but the root of all of them is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. One should be attached to the root of everything rather than bewildered by the branches and leaves. That is the instruction given in this verse. Thank you. Uh, can we ask her a quick question, Patti, or you want to continue on? Just the description of that last thing. Once well, you no, it's important. This, that's the last slide on the on the first of the Chatur Shloki, so everybody should understand that verse well. Yeah. Well, what, what do you think about that last sentence? One should be attached to the root of everything ra rather than bewildered by the branches and leaves. That is the instruction given in this verse. What's those branches? What, what's those branches and leaves? Who are you asking? I'm asking Vaishnavi. Oh. Uh, maybe demigods or any other um, um, vibhutis or the opulences of Lord in different different aspects. It could be somebody with a lot of money or somebody who has a lot of power and so on. Yes, everything but everything but Krishna. Mm -hmm. Everything. Everything. Uh, okay, so Nanda's going to read next, but do you have one thing to add okay. to that, Nandaji? Uh, oh, no, you want to go? No, everything's fine. Okay. okay I, I just wanted, before we go on, to go over this one more time. This is the verse 2933. Brahma, mm it is I the personality of Godhead who is existing before the creation when there was nothing but myself, nor was there the material nature, the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead. And after annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. Okay, Nanda, two. Uh, 2934. Rite ritam yat prati prati yeta na prati yeta chatmani tad vidya atmano mayam yata baso yata tama o brah. Whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. 
Srila Prabhupada's purport. In the previous verse, it has already been concluded that in any stage of the cosmic manifestations, its appearance, its sustenance, its growth, its interactions or different, its interactions of different energies, its deterioration and its disappearance, all has its basic relation with the existence of the personality of Godhead. And as such, whenever there is forgetfulness of this prime relation with the Lord, and where whenever things are accepted as real without being related to the Lord, that conception is called a product of the illusory energy of the Lord. Because nothing can exist without the Lord. It should be known that the illusory energy of the Lord is also an energy of the Lord. The right conclusion of dovetailing everything in relationship with the Lord is called yoga maya or the energy of union and the wrong conception of detaching a thing from its relationship with the Lord is called the Lord's daivi maya or maha maya. Both the mayas also have connections with the Lord because nothing can exist without being related to him. As such, the wrong conception of detaching relationships from the Lord is not false, but illusory. What does that mean, real quick? It's like if you go out, if you go out and pick some branches from the tree, and then you wonder why these branches are drying up. It's because they're disconnected from the tree. So any relationship that we have, it's not connected by the tree. Now the tree considers, you know, you got. The, just the tree isn't the thing, but it's the root because the, the, the tree is alive through the root. So anything that we have that's not or see or have a relationship with that's not connected by the root or, you know, to the trunk, to the root of the tree is uh, the tree of Krishna. It's, it, it's not, it's not, um, it's not false. There are relationships, there are things, but it's illusory in the sense that we didn't connect it Krishna and therefore it'll be temporary and most likely cause some sort of misery. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Uh, is Rao with us at all? Rao, are you there? Okay. Uh, Tisha, would you read the next one, please? Report continued. Misconceiving one thing for another thing is called illusion. For example, accepting a rope as a snake is illusion, but the rope is not false. The rope, as it exists in the front of the illusion person, is not at all false, but the acceptance is illusory. Therefore, the wrong conception of accepting this material manifestation as being divorced from the energy of the Lord is illusion, but it is not false. And this illusory conception is called the reflection of the reality in the darkness of ignorance. Anything that appears as apparently not being produced out of my energy is called Maya. In all circumstances, the Lord and the living entities are individual personalities and the personal features of both the Lord and living beings are never abolished. Only the influence of the illusory energy, the reflection of light in the darkness can, by the mercy of the Lord, be removed. In the material world, the light of the sun is also not independent, nor is that of the moon. The real source of light is the Brahma Jyoti, which diffuses light from the transcendental body of the Lord, and the same light is reflected in varieties of light the light of the sun, the light of the moon, the light of fire, or the light of electricity. So the identity of the self as being unconnected with the supreme self, the Lord, is also illusion. And the false claim, I am the supreme, is, is the last illusory snare of the same maya, or the external energy of the Lord. Thank you, Tisha. Um, Next would, uh, Kadasi, would you like to read next? Vedanta Sutra, in the very beginning, affirms that everything is born from the Supreme. 
And thus, as explained in the previous verse, all individual living entities are born from the energy of the supreme living being, the personality of Godhead. Brahma himself was born from the energy of the Lord, and all other living entities are born from the energy of the Lord through the agency of Brahma. None of them has any existence without being dovetailed with the Supreme Lord. The independence of the individual living entity is not real independence, but is just the reflection of the real independence existing in the Supreme Being, the Lord. The false claim of supreme independence by the conditioned souls is illusion, and this conclusion is admitted in this verse. The medical practitioner may deny the existence of the soul in the physiological bodily construction of an individual person, but he cannot give life to a dead body, even though all the mechanisms of the body exist even after death. The psychologists make the serious study of the, of the physiological conditions of the brain, as if the construction of the cerebral lump were the machine of the functioning mind. But in the dead body, the psychologist cannot bring back the function of the mind. The illusory energy has two phases of existence, namely the, co the covering influence and the throwing influence. By the throwing influence, the illusory energy throws the living entities into the darkness of ignorance. And by the covering influence, she covers the eyes did I say into the darkness of ignorance? And by the covering influence, she covers the eyes of men with a poor fund of knowledge about the existence of the supreme person who enlightened the supreme individual living being, Brahma. The Lord says in the Bhagavad Gita 16, 18 to 20, that demoniac persons who deny the existence of the Lord are thrown more and more into the darkness of ignorance. And thus, such demoniac persons transmigrate life after life without any knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thank you. Um, let's move on uh, with Ian reading, and we'll, we'll have our discussion if, we have, uh, if we'd like at the end. Okay, actually, I wanted to bring out one thing before oh. we leave this, this uh, particular purport. Okay. Um, this part right here talks about how it works. The illusory energy has two phases of existence, namely the covering influence and the throwing influence. By throwing influence, the illusory energy throws the living entities into the darkness of ignorance. This is called prakshipatnika. It's a Sanskrit word means to throw. And then by the covering influence, avaranatmika means to cover. So the, the, the illusory energy forces the living entity into a particular circumstance, like a body. Then the illusory, covers, the illusory energy covers that living entity to forget its real identity and identify with the body. So if we understand the mechanics of how things are working, sometimes it helps us to clarify what's reality and what's illusion. Thank you. Okay, next, Ian, would you like to read? Okay, Purport continued. The same, the same man, however, is enlightened in the specific succession from Brahmaji, who was personally instructed by the Lord, or in the specific succession from Arjuna, who was personally instructed by the Lord in the Bhagavad Gita. He accepts this statement of Lord that Bhagavad Gita 10.8, I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this perfectly engage in my devotional service and worship me. Sorry. And worship me with all their hearts. Although the reflectory energy of the Lord displays various illusions to the eyes of persons with a poor fund of knowledge, the same person knows that clearly that the Lord can act even from far, far beyond our vision, but his different energies, just as fire can diffuse heat and light from a distant place. There's one supreme person who is the pro progenitor of this cosmic manifestation and whose energy acts as property. 
or the material nature, dazzling like a reflection. By such illusory action of prakriti, even dead matter is caused to move by the by the cooperation of living energy, energy of the Lord. And the material world appears like a dramatic performance to ignorant eyes. So you have to leave for a little while. Thank you, Ian. Um, Tisha, you want to read the next one? Purport continued. <clears throat> Fire is possessed of heat, but heat is not fire. This simple thing is not understood by the man with the poor fund of knowledge who falsely claims that the fire and heat are the same. This energy of the fire, namely heat, is explained here as a reflection and not directly fire. Therefore, the living entity represented by the living entities is the reflection of the Lord and never the Lord himself. Being the reflection of the Lord, the existence of the living entity is dependent on the Supreme Lord, who is the original light. This material energy may be compared to darkness, as actually it is darkness, and the activities of the living entities in the darkness are reflections of the original light. The Lord should be understood by the context of this verse. Non-dependence of both the energies of the Lord is explained as maya or illusion. No one can make a solution of the darkness of ignorance simply by the reflection of light. Similarly, no one can come out of material existence simply by the reflected light of the common man. One has to receive the light from the original light itself. The reflection of sunlight in the darkness is unable to drive out the darkness, but the sunlight outside the reflection can drive out the darkness completely. In darkness, no one can see the things in the room. Therefore, a person in the dark is afraid of snakes and scorpions, although there may not be such things. But in the light, the things in the room can be clearly seen and the fear of snakes and scorpions is at once removed. <clears throat> Therefore, one has to take shelter of the light of the Lord as in the Bhagavad Gita or the Srimad Bhagavatam and not the reflected personalities who have no touch with the light. No one should hear Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam from a person who does not believe in the existence of the Lord. Such a person is already doomed, and any association with such a doomed person makes the associator also doomed. Oh, boy. That's a <laughs> wonderful sentence by Chula Prabhupada. <laughs> I'd like to hear somebody explain that a little further, this whole, this whole example of the light and the reflection and the reality. Who would like to explain it? I'm going to call on someone. Faye. Faye, you have to explain that, my darling. Why me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm organized. This is how I'm organized. It. And I think you'll give us a good explanation. I will certainly try Mataji, but I don't know that I can. Okay. A Go reflection on. is something that actually isn't real. A reflection is more illusionary in its existence. Whereas if you're looking at the real source of the real light, you're looking at that which is Krishna or God. If you want to get out of the darkness, that's where you got to get the light from Krishna, not from the reflection, which is an illusion. And if you think of the material world as being that of darkness and those who do not, do not believe in God at all are running around with flashlights and mirrors, they're not able to get out of the darkness per se. Their mechanical means of flashlights and mirrors reflected is not going to get them into the real light at all. Okay. Very good, great. wonderful. Yeah. Now I want to hear somebody else 
comment, Faye, Faye said it, but I want somebody else to expand on it a little bit. When she says that the reflection is an illusion, what does that mean? Somebody say, I'm gonna call on someone. Can I add this? Yes. Yes. Um, an illusion is something which, not what it seems to be, something else. Uh, like said, is the rope and the snake? Is, is that a good um, example? Very good. You say the rope. Take no, the that's rope, not right? a good example. Is that that's, a good a, example? That's, that's an illusion. There's a difference between the illusion and the reflection. Wait the reflection, a reflection, okay. The reflection, there has to be something solid that the reflection comes from. Ah, it, has to, it has to come from something, something. That's the point, yes. Okay. Yeah. A, re a reflection depends on 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 that which it, on that which it's reflecting it doesn't exist by itself it's reflecting something else like you put something in front of the mirror if you take the object that it's reflecting away from the mirror then it's no longer reflecting it it doesn't really exist it's only it's only the reflection of that object so I'm just hoping that this becomes more clear. This is the example that Krishna is giving. Anything that we see that we think exists separate from Lord, that concept of our, our vision is an illusion. And Ian, that's like the example of the snake and the rope. You, the, the, the rope is real, but the concept that it's a snake is an illusion. So the concept that something exists separate from God is an illusion. And that's what he's trying to point out. May I ask a question? Yes, sure. please. Okay, so uh, just like moments ago, we, we, we talked about, Prabhu, you talked about the throwing influence and the covering influence. And and um, so so with 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 the reflected light you know like say for instance you know like the maya bodies or philosophy that shua Prabhupada is uh speaking about um trying to give information or you know bogusly trying to give information like false gurus or you know Prabhupada said guru is a guru but um people who are pretending to have this light and are actually reflections um, so this, the, the, the covering aspect is, is that part of like that type, type of problem where Maya is like completely covering, um, their eyes to believe that they know Krishna when they, they're just a, a reflection in the sense that they think they have the information coming from Krishna, but they don't. Yes. They're misleading. Right. Is that, yeah. Okay. Earlier, when you were reading, I believe it was you, there was an example, um, and we didn't expand on it because of time and everything, but the, the sky in a pot and the sky outside the pot. The Mayavadi philosophy propounds that when the, when the sky in the pot leaves the pot, if the pot is broken at the end of life, death comes, then the air in the pot, the sky in the pot leaves the pot and merges back with the totality of air in space. It loses its individuality. And we can all relate with that. It, it sounds logical. It actually does make sense. The sky in the pot does merge with this greater sky. But the question the Vaishnava commentators ask is, how can the living entity be compared to the pot and the sky within the pot? There's a difference. It's not a good analogy. Although it sounds logical, and it is a good example, it's not a clear one because the individuality of the living entity remains. Another example is like the drop of water that you put back into the sea, it merges with the ocean and can no longer be discerned as the, indig as the individual drop. So therefore it merges with the ocean. And the Mayavadi philosophy is that the living entity merges with cosmic consciousness, with one, with the one totality of consciousness. We actually agree with that. But it also retains its, it, it, its individuality eternally, nityo nityanam, or sanatan. So these are some of the details. Does that help clear it up? 
I, I'd like to add something to that. The last <laughs> time uh, you asked a question before Mamantara um, about what what remains, what remains. So that that pot that the Maya bodies are referring to uh, could be considered the body. And even in Buddhism, the Tao, everything merges. The material energy merges into all material um, um, forms, merge into the totality of the material energy. But the soul is different. The soul does not die. The soul is different from the body. The soul is not the pot the, 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 or the water or the, the, soul. the soul is the eternal thing, that other this, this is not who I am. The body is separate, no matter what kind of body it is. Okay. We have one more part of the purport to read. One, one quick question. Also. Okay. Yeah. Um, can we just go back to that previous slide, please? The one about the reflection of the sun. Um. That's the last one, Patti, the one before it, maybe. I think the one before that, yeah. Yeah, so if it says, what Prabhupada says here, the reflection of sunlight in the darkness is unable to drive out the darkness. So is that like, if I, if I have a, a photograph of the sun, you know, and I whip that out, that's not going <laughs> to take out the, is that what that means? I think that's pretty close. You don't get much light from a reflection. Okay. You know, it's very, very dim at best. Okay. Is that, Patti, was that what we were discussing this morning? He was talking to me a lot about this reflection in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, yeah, just like if, if you have the little mirror or even a big mirror, no matter how big your mirror is, you, you can only shine it on a, on, on, on a small segment of earth. Whereas if you have the sun in the sky, it shines on the whole thing. So to dissipate darkness, to really dissipate the darkness requires reality. The, the illusory elements that we have in our consciousness, which lie there and keep us bound, can only be dissipated by reality, by the Lord. And, and, and those little illusions that we hold on to, there's, they're, they're what keep everyone bound in this material world because it's illusory. As, as, as we speak, I want to put this up because uh, I was wondering if a time would come where I could use it. Let me read this to everyone. This is the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. I offer my obeisances unto Lord Sri Krishna, son of Vasudev, who is the supreme all-pervading personality of Godhead. I meditate upon him the transcendent reality, who is the primal cause of all causes, from whom all manifested universes arise, in whom they dwell, and by whom they're destroyed. I meditate upon that eternally effulgent Lord who is directly and indirectly conscious of all the manifestations, yet is beyond them. It is he only who first imparted Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahma, the first created being. Through him, his, through him, this world, like a mirage, appears real, even to great sages and demigods. Because of him, the material universe is created by the three modes of nature appear to be factual, although they are unreal. I meditate upon him, the absolute truth, who is eternally existent in his transcendental abode, and who is forever freed from illusion. I thought that tied so beautifully into what we're reading. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's like a tapestry. It, it, it looks like a uh, summary of the Chacha Shloki. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it really is. The first verse of the Bhagavatam is the summary of the whole thing. Amazing. And again, again, although they are unreal, the sense that the universes are unreal, that's the snake and the rope. It's the concept that they're eternal, which is, makes them unreal. Truth and truth and reality have to be eternal to be actually real. So we have one more verse to read at the end. Narayan, would you read that? And then I think we've covered everybody reading several times. Okay. Purport continued. According to the Padma Puran, within the material compass, there are innumerable material universes. All of them are full of darkness. 
any living being beginning from the Brahmas, there are innumerable Brahmas in innumerable universes. To the insignificant end, all are born in darkness and they require factual light for, from the Lord to see them directly. Just as the sun can be seen only in the direct light of the sun. No lamp or man-made torchlight, however powerful it may be, can help one see the sun. The sun reveals itself. Therefore, the action of different energies of the Lord or the personality of Godhead himself can be realized by the light manifested by the causeless mercy of the Lord. The impersonalists say that God cannot be seen. God can be seen by the light of God and not by man made speculations. Here, this light is specifically mentioned as Vidyat, which is an order of the, law of the Lord to Brahma. This direct order of the Lord is a maintenance of his internal energy and this particular energy is the means of seeing the Lord face to face. Not only Brahma, but anyone who may be graced by the Lord to see such merciful direct internal energy can also realize the personality of Godhead without any mental speculation. Thank you. That, that, that concludes this, um, the readings for today. Does anyone have any other question or something to add to this? The two of the first two of the most important verses in the Bhagavatam, from which everything else is coming. So everyone is fully self-realized at this point, mm -hmm. and we are on our way back to Godhead. That's Before cool. we close up, then I just want to uh, again reiterate this one: Ritam yat pratiyata na pratiyata chetmani. O oh, Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection, which appears to be in darkness. Well, that kind of solves all the problems. Just meditate on that, and then we can know the difference between reality and illusion. Okay? Thank you everyone for your kind attention and uh, we'll see you next week. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 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 Krishna.